Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's great to be here today. Um, we always love talking about cover crops. And um, I'm a research geneticist, so I'm a plant breeder with the USDA. And I've been working with my colleague Lais um, over the last many years, um, breeding peas across the country. Um, so Lais and I will share this presentation and go back and forth. Um, Lais, is there anything that um, you wanted to add uh, about yourself before we begin? Sure, just to make clear, I'm postdoc with Corteva, but this work I actually did uh, with Lisa during my PhD research. Excited to share some results also. Thanks so much, Lais. Um, so let's dive in. We're going to discuss winter peas specifically in a cover crop context. Of course, peas can be used um, in many different ways, many different seasons, and many applications. So our work with peas is one of many species that we breed um, as plant breeders in the cover crop breeding network. So this is a wonderful network that started uh, six to seven years ago and brings together USDA research centers from across the country, the USDA um, NRCS plant material centers, and also universities. So we have a really rich group of um, sites and um, mines from north to south, east to west. In addition to those researchers that are involved in our grant network, uh, we also work closely with farmers. So we have a network of farmers who actively have breeding and um, trial sites on their farms. They're primarily located in the northern Midwest, but we do work with growers across the country. Um, and we also actively invite growers and seed companies to our our field days to get their feedback about the lines that we are creating and what we should be um, working on within our research. So the primary species that we breed within our cover crop breeding network are winter peas, hairy vetch, crimson clover, cereal rye, and we have just this year begun a new adventure breeding brassicas primarily in the, the camelina and rapeseed family. Um, and look forward to that work. And we are always open to your thoughts on what we should be improving. Uh, we, again, get that feedback through um, field days, but um, also periodically run surveys to get grower and um, industry feedback on our work. And Lais will share details of cover crop peas. So I hear all the time when I say, oh, we breed winter peas, people say, oh, Austrian winter peas, and they're often used synonymously. And so I'm trying to tease that apart to show why I'm not talking about Austrian winter peas, why I'm using the term of winter peas, that Austrian winter peas are one specific type of winter pea, but we breed more beyond um, just Austrian winter peas. And I think for your farms or for um, your work with seeds and cover crops, you can think more broadly beyond Austrian winter peas. So um, go ahead, Lais. Yeah, I think I like to think of Austrian winter peas as like a generic name. Um, it's not a specific cultivar. It's kind of like a variety non-stated of winter peas can really be anything in there. Um, so that's why we call just winter peas because we're actually breeding specific lines. And just, just to explain a little bit about peas and their differences. So we can have a spring type and a winter type. And peas are not like uh, wheat where you need vernalization. You know, like winter wheat, you need the vernalization. Peas don't need that. The only difference between the spring and winter is that they can survive the winter, basically. Uh, so the winter theoretically can be planted anywhere uh, in any time. It's not going to perform as well, you know, depending on the time that you plant, but it, it can be planted. Whereas if you plant a spring pea on fall in colder climates, it will die. Like in North Carolina, that's where I did my PhD, and we actually have spring peas planted late fall, and they will survive because it's not cold enough. Um, so that's the biggest difference, the ability to survive the winter and not a vernalization requirement. Uh, another difference that you can see in peas is the kind of leaf. They can have what it's called a semi-leafless or a leafy. And it's just the amount of tendrils versus the common leaf structure that they can have. Uh, there is no, nothing inherently bad or good for cover crop production. The, the cover crop peas tend to be leafy, 
but semi-leafless could also produce enough biomass. Although a lot of the grain peas are semi-leafless because they do tend to um, lodge less because they will use their little tendrils to stay upright. So it can increase seed yield, but there's nothing inherently like wrong with one way or another. And also uh, the seed coat color, it can be clear or it can be pigmented and you can see in the image the difference. Um, also the seed size, of course, and uh, cover crops stand to be darker color, uh, but they don't have to, they can be clear seed. So it's a matter of breeding and choosing what we want. Thanks, Lace. And Lace, typically for those clear seed coats, um, those are peas that can enter like a human food consumption as a grain or a livestock with the grain. And that's not the case for pigmented, is that right? Yes, correct. Yes. Great. Thanks. Yeah. So those pigmented ones are um, have historically been used for animal feed um, and other uses um, like that. So we we include both clear seed coat and pigmented peas within the breeding program. And like Lais mentioned, both semi-leafless and leafy, but um, a, a lot of the material we have is, is leafy. Um, and then we only focus on winter peas within our particular breeding program. Um, that said, you know, spring peas, are a big component of the cover crop um, seed industry and usage. And they're used frequently with oats, um, often in prevent plant kind of situations, uh, but we are not specifically breeding those and we won't be talking about them today. Uh, but there is great work happening um, at other institutions, um, especially University of Illinois on spring peas and spring pea genetics. Oh, Lisa, just another thing to add that I didn't put here, but it's a flower color. It can be either white or purple. Um, if normally, if we have both on a plot and we have good looking plants with both uh, flower colors, we will choose the white one. So it can be a little bit more palatable uh, if the farmer decides to use that for forage later. Uh, but again, nothing wrong. We have both in the program. Thanks so much, Lise. Sorry to stop you early. Great. So I want to start out with the reality of um, growing peas from the upper Midwest. I'm guessing most of the folks on this call are from the northern part of the United States, either the northern Midwest or the northeast. And this is the risky part about trying peas where, um, where we are. Uh, so we have a lot of data after many years of trialing. So this is six years of breeding nurseries with so much diversity of peas um, and also advanced line trials where we have larger plots that are testing these all across the country. Um, so I think this gives a good idea for peas as a species of how they can perform for winter survival across many different environments and which parts of the country will more consistently have survival and which ones are um, riskier locations to try peas and have more, more winter death. So this in red, um, this image shows what parts of the country have experienced at least one year with over 80% survival in a stand. So it's pretty, pretty solidly, okay, the, these made it there. But then if we look at what had 50 to 80% survival, what regions of the country in at least one year, we start to see more death happening um, in, in the Northern US and even throughout the middle part of the country. Um, but you know, 50 to 80% stand, it, you could still get a nice cover crop and a good deal of biomass off of that. The next part is where the risk really comes. So this green is showing regions that have years of less than 50% survival. So if you're a grower and you spend a lot of money planting peas because they're quite expensive, and then you get less than 50% of those peas surviving, um, it, it's not a, a good use of, of money, in my opinion. I think um, they, they you, you've lost money in, in that particular um, stand. And then we get years where nothing survived. So a lot of this happened in the polar vortex year of 2019, um, but other years as well, especially in North Dakota and in Minnesota too. Um, so with zero, you know, it's a complete waste of, of that money of planting that crop, in my opinion. Um, so these regions here in the, the Northern Midwest, um, we, we caution people that um, you want to make sure that 
um, you really want to invest in in that P um, until we have better genetics available, um, which which may or may not happen. To be honest, um, to have something consistently survive in these areas, and um, the difficult part here is um, snow cover. So um, you know this like uh, northeast Iowa region, even down into Missouri. Sometimes you you get a mild winter, but if you get a cold winter, you don't get a lot of snow, and those peas can really suffer. So this, these are risky places to, to grow peas, um, but they're great places to select and to breed winter peas for winter survival. So we'll, I'll talk about breeding and, and um, the work that we've done with genetic improvement. Um, and then I'll talk basic agro um, agronomic research about how to increase winter survival of peas in your field. So here's our breeding process. Our collaborator, uh, Rebecca McGee in Washington state crosses um, different peas by hand. So this requires um, taking pollen from a male parent of one variety and crossing it with uh, a different variety uh, to be used as the female to create genetic variation that we can then put into the breeding program since this crop is a selfing species. So it's self-pollinated. And after getting that diversity, we run them through a growth chamber um, freezing system that Steve Mulkey has helped develop at University of Minnesota in order to rapidly screen lines for winter survival. And we're just starting this process in the breeding program now and look forward to that. Um, and after that, when we've screened out a number that are not winter hardy, uh, we then take them to breeding nurseries and send these throughout the country. So we have eight different nurseries that each have 50 to 150 families and LAIS helps set up the structure so we can get a lot of diversity out there and be able to uh, also get a diversity of environments um, to get those environments that are going to be optimal to put winter pressure on, kill a lot, but have a few really star performing um, genotypes that will survive the winter. Um, and then once we get those star performers, we increase their seed enough to send them to um, trials across the country to grow in larger plots and um, assess the best across the country for variety release. And that's at the stage that we're at now. So we're at year seven of this breeding program and we are moving our first um, lines to variety release. And we'll talk about that um, at the end of the presentation. Um, and this is what the those advanced trials look like when we have a larger plot. Um, we're still seed limited, so our advanced line trials at this point are single row plots flanked by triticale to simulate mixtures that growers are typically using of a grass and a legume together as a cover crop. So what does it take to breed peas for winter hardiness? Um, here's a an image of a fall um, planting of peas at um, Mark Dudless Farm. Here's Mark and in Wisconsin, and they look lovely. We have a lot of diversity here. And then in the spring, it looks like a complete disaster that all these peas have died. Um, we had 9% survival out there, but from a breeder's perspective, this is a great opportunity. So the winter has really eliminated a lot of lines that did not have winter hardiness. And um, some lines that came out of this particular breeding nursery in 2017 um, have been some of our best. And Lays will discuss that of how they performed in the trials. Um, but to get something like this, which is um, a success from a breeding standpoint, um, we need a lot of environments to get there. So winter is unpredictable and variable, um, and often we don't know what we're going to get. So in our very um, broad screen of 24 environments, 15 of them were too warm and almost everything survived. And five of these nursery environments were too cold and everything died. A lot of those were in the polar vortex year of 2019. So these, um, we can't select anything meaningful. We don't see the better genotypes of peas, um, but four of them were just right. And they had a small amount of survival to identify the best lines. And some of our best lines in the program have come um, from these, uh, these nurseries. And all of these nurseries um, were on-farm uh, collaborator participants. So these are organic farms throughout the northern Midwest from Iowa, North Dakota, and Wisconsin uh, that um, have successfully selected some great peas um, for the breeding program and ideally for growers in the future. So now on to agronomics of how to get winter peas to survive in um, cold parts of the country. 
wisdom that we learned from Rebecca McGee in Washington is to plant the peas deep. So um, frost shearing um, in the winter is a main component of how a lot of legumes die and don't survive in, in cold conditions um, in fluctuating freezing and thawing. And so in frost heaving, you get um, the separation of the root from the top part of the plant. And peas are unique um, among most of the legumes in that their growing point um, is very low. It can be below the ground if you plant the peas deep enough. And so it can be this like Lazarus effect to let the peas re-sprout from under the ground if they are planted that deep and they do get frost um, shearing over the winter. Seeding date was a bit of a mystery. So we heard a lot from researchers and a lot of published um, cover crop research says to plant peas um, in late August early September at the very latest to maximize your biomass in the spring. And so a lot of people took that, you know, and, and took those recommendations, but then growers were telling us something different, especially growers in North Dakota. And they said, no, the only survival is if you plant them as late as possible in late September, or early October. And so we said, okay, what, what really is the best seeding date for winter survival? So we designed a study that has three different locations, um, New York, Minnesota, and North Dakota, and um, then two different um, mixtures. So a monoculture of peas, and then um, a mixture of those peas with uh, grass. And a mixture of peas and grass is often what is used in um, an agricultural setting. That's a typical grower mix. And it does improve survival a bit. So that grass can help um, capture snow to buffer, uh, give a bit of a blanket for um, temperature fluctuations, protect um, the peas. And um, then we had four different varieties that are currently on the market included in this study, um, Blaze, Ice Cold, Windham, and Wild Winter. Um, and then four different planting dates. So from late August into um, middle September, late September, and then early October. And this is what the trial looked like at Minnesota in uh, 2021 and 2022. So in the fall, you can see in the foreground here, the plots that were planted the earliest um, in the first week of September. And then uh, these peas were planted in mid-September, these peas were planted in late September, and then the peas all the way at the back were planted at um, the beginning of October. But then in the spring, um, you can see really major differences here. So the foreground, these peas that look beautiful in the fall, are pretty much all gone. Um, so they died over the winter. And similarly in the back, those ones that were planted in very late October did not do well. And even the mid-September um, planting did not do well. So um, this uh, sweet spot at the end of September is what worked best for Minnesota last year. Uh, so we're collecting the data now from the second year of the trial, and there is one more year of the trial to go. So the results that I'm showing are only from one year at three sites. Um, so we look forward to validating this further in two years to come. Uh, but across the sites, really these, the um, late September or middle September planting dates tended to be um, the best. So here's this previous recommendation um, that was given by researchers of when to plant um, the peas to maximize biomass. And here's the data from New York showing that whether it's in mixture here with the grass or in monoculture here, um, the, the biomass um, was not best at that early planting date that was previously recommended. So leaning more toward the middle of September, but especially you know late September was um, a good decision. In Minnesota, similar results. So this late September planting date did very well. Um, and this previous recommendation of the beginning of September had pretty um, awful winter survival. We're hovering right around 0% survival, as you saw in that picture. And this middle September didn't do as well. Um, one interesting thing to note is that Wyo winter, um, one of these varieties that, that does pretty well for winter survival and was developed in Wyoming, um, it actually did best in the October planting date in the first week of October um, and didn't do as well in late September. But all three of the other varieties that we tested did best in this late September. So there might be a bit of a variety effect um, in optimizing planting date, but overall, um, Late September looks like a good time to plant. And we looked forward to validating it with um, two more years of data. 
So seating rate is um, a really important um, thing to me. Uh, we have run a profitability calculation in Harry Vetch to see, okay, like how much um, does it cost for um, producing nitrogen from Vetch as a cover crop versus buying urea at various urea prices, even the really high urea prices like happened in 2022. Um, and what parts of the country um, you know, frequently make a profit off of using vetch as a cover crop for nitrogen um, instead of just urea. And what parts of the country is it kind of um, not profitable? Is it typically cheaper to buy something like urea? And you could do the same calculation for organic fertilizers as well um, to, to see that difference. So seeding rate in that particular study was the biggest determinant of whether something would be um, profitable or not. Um, it was actually more important than how much biomass was produced at a particular location. Um, and we don't have as good of studies in peas yet to optimize seeding rate. So research is needed to show what is that minimum amount of seed that you can um, buy of peas in order to um, reach a, a stable threshold of biomass and maximize that biomass because um, that could save growers a lot of money. Um, peas are often the most expensive cover crop component in a mix um, and uh, so we want to save growers money by using as little seed as necessary um, to get as much biomass. So again, we need more research, but in the meantime, um, 5.6 seeds per square feet is a common recommended rate for winter peas. Um, but keep in mind that pea size varies widely to get that 5.6 seeds per square feet. So there's a threefold range in the size of, of peas from 1,600 to 15 to 5,000 seeds per pound. So here's kind of a small kind of Austrian winter pea, dark seeded type, um, pigmented, and then a larger um, clear uh, seed coat pea up here. And because of that difference in size, the recommended seeding rates uh, range from something around 50 pounds per acre for small seeds to threefold that at 150 pounds per acre for larger seeds. Um, and so the common recommended rate is around 82 pounds per acre. But again, you could save a lot of money and get a better stand if you ask for the seeds per pound from that particular bag of seed that you're buying and then calculate your rate of pounds per acre um, based on that uh, seed size instead. And most likely, um, Lais is running the calculations now to look at profitability. Um, that seeding rate is going to make a big impact um, on whether it's profitable to grow peas for nitrogen. All right, and now I'm going to hand it over to Lais, who is going to talk about um, variety performance across the country. Great. So here we're going to look at the results for our advanced line trial. And as Lisa said, the advanced line trial is the last part of the breeding process. Um, and it happens across all the country where we're actually trying to decide uh, which seeds are the best, which entries are the best ones. And we have four years of data so far. So planted in fall 2018 um, to fall 2022. We look at the traits for biomass, and I'm going to explain them in the detail. Winter survival, fall vigor, and spring vigor. Um, these traits were chosen because those are the most important traits for the farmer. So that's what we are spending most time. But if more other important things come up, we're also going to incorporate them into the breeding program. So. Like Lisa showed on the photo on this advanced line trial, we plant one line of peas and they have one line on each side of a grass, normally 3 decay or could be rye, to mimic that seed mixture. And this way we can also use less um, seed of peas because we don't have that much and you still have a good result and they will still climb using the grass as a companion plant. So this is really important. And here I wanted to show a little bit the difference across geographies or even in one geography. So this first photo is in March in North Carolina in the year 2021. And here's a month later. So North Carolina, very warm. It grows really fast. It's pretty impressive. And you can see the same 
maybe a little bit bigger P in May in Wisconsin than in March in North Carolina. I think this is a good visualization just to keep in mind the importance of the environment um, and how they will look different uh, where they are. And we collect biomass at the closest, around the date of the main cash crop planting. So normally it's corn. Uh, we have collected actually in two dates, would be like an early crop like corn and then a little bit later for like a soybean planting. But we didn't observe much difference, at least for peas, in the rankings of the peas in the early or late harvest. So now a lot of places only harvest one time, but that's because we didn't see difference. And what performed good in the first harvest was also performing good on the second harvest. Some results for the biomass. So we had a very robust data set, 20 site years, a combination. This is, there is nothing like that of this research in the US. Like this is the biggest one. Um, nothing is perfect, but it's the biggest one. Hopefully we will publish all these results soon to be available, but this is very exciting. So there is robustness to the data. There is more confidence in what we are saying. And I am very happy that a lot of our lines, so here you have the rank and then the entry. And I highlighted the commercial checks or the public checks in orange so we can have an idea. So a lot of our lines performed better than what's out there. Uh, this Romac, just a caveat, this is an older cultivar. It's actually not sold anymore. It's available on GRIN or for, through the USDA. It's a public line and it does perform really well, which is a little bit annoying, uh, but it's a purple flower entry. Um, it's kind of stable. So I think it's a good check, but we also have why winter, blaze, windham, icicle to compare. And you can see how much lower um, those checks are in the ranking, okay? And something that is pretty interesting from this data set is that the best performing lines were selected in cold environments, like Lisa was saying, was in Wisconsin on the farm, North Dakota, in our nursery in New York. And this might not always be true, but maybe something that is selected in the colder, because it can survive, we'll have some biomass there. It can also perform well in the warmer conditions. So this gives a little bit more insight in the breeding programs and how peas behave. Um, and also a testament to a good partnership between you know, the breeding efforts and, and farmers. So very, very important. Another very important trait for the colder sites is winter survival. Uh, for this data set, we only have nine site years. And you can see 27 to nine, because like Lisa was mentioning, it can be pretty hard to find the correct uh, weather condition to have this data where you have enough kill, but also not too much kill. Um, and so I would say, thank you for slight grain of salt because only nine site years, but it's, it's also like good to know. Um, Blaze did perform best on the survival. Although if we go back and we look, it did not perform so good in the biomass. So it's not necessarily, not the best survivor, it's not necessarily gonna be the best biomass yield at the end of the season. And they, they perform, Blaze performed well also in more mild conditions uh, instead of the harsher, winters. The, those two entries that were selected at a farmer uh, perform very well in Wisconsin and North Dakota. It's not surprising seeing where they came from. Also Lakeview Organics VNS was a good check for winter survival. Um, surprising North Carolina VNS. We don't know what's in the bag. It is just sold in North Carolina. Uh, we, we do produce our own seed every year. So it's the same. We know that's the same genetic material, but we don't know much about it. But some other promising lines. And 
surprisingly icicle, not very winter resistant, came in the bottom. Whistler also, wind hunt and wild winter were not bad. And also good checks to keep in our breeding program to make sure that we can outperform them. Paul Vigor. Paul Vigor also very robust data set because there's no time to kill things yet. Um, I have a lot of confidence on this data. So for the Vigor, what we do is we walk the field and we look at the plots and the worst is gonna have a score of one and the best is gonna have a score of nine. And we are trying to see to range biomass. So looking at the plot, how much biomass we think. Uh, and that's how we score the fall figure because we would like to release a variety that can still have some coverage on the fall and still protect the soil on the fall and also produce some biomass in the spring. So it's a it's a game that we have to play because if they grow too much on the fall, like you saw on the planting date, uh, they may die. They will likely die. So there is a kind of sweet spot between growth in the fall, survival, and then biomass on the spring, and we are trying to play with that to make sure that we have just the perfect uh, cultivar. And for fall vigor, very happy to say that we have many, many lines beating our checks. Uh, the first check that appears is Romac at the 17th place. So we are very good to go there. Uh, and all the other checks also worse. Wild winter is pretty interesting because it, it will grow more on the spring. It's pretty small on the fall and then on the spring it kind of picks up and it's a good check. And we do the same scoring that we do for vigor in the fall. We do early in spring after the, the last frost. Sometimes it has to be rescored because we think it's the last frost but it's actually not and that's okay. Um, so when the plants start to grow up again that's when that's scored so we can see how fast they are getting out of the ground and producing the biomass. Uh, Romac shows here, again, that older cultivar that we have as a check, it does pretty well, but our varieties can beat it. And you can see again here, some varieties that were selected in the farmers, the ones that showed up for biomass later in the season are showing up for early spring vigor, which is really encouraging when we think about future lines. While winter comes up in 20, the best, let's say, available commercial cultivar. So we have a lot of lines in the pipeline better than available checks. We were really curious to see what what patterns of the weather could contribute to each of those traits that we are looking into, what the characteristics that we want. And we were able to find that for the fall vigor, so that early fall vigor, the relative humidity and the soil texture were important. And what I think that it tells us is water availability, right? Do you have enough water to germinate and grow? So we looked, into how much rain you had up to 15 days before planting. So Kenny, did you have rain? Did the soil store water well? So I think that's what the data is telling us a little bit. For early spring vigor, things change a bit because I think early spring vigor can also has to do with survivability, right? If a lot of things died and then they don't regrow, you have, it has bad vigor or we grow very slow. Um, and some of the things that came up was the fall acclimation. So did the plant have enough time? Did the temperatures decrease is low enough so that the plant could acclimate to the winter and survive before the first frost? That was really important. Wind speed and snow cover, those are related, right? You might have snow, but if you have a lot of wind, the snow is going to get blown away, and then you don't have the snow cover. And the snow cover can act as a temperature barrier for the piece, and it will protect it. So we can survive better when you have a lot of snow cover. Another very interesting thing that we thought was gonna be there, and it, the data actually shows this, is this spring freezing days after green up. So after the plants start to grow, did you have a frost? 
Because then sometimes it's not even the true winter survival, it's a spring survival. You know, because if the plants wake up, it's like, oh, I'm ready to grow, I'm ready you know, to set some flowers, it cannot sustain a cold freeze anymore. Um, so it just may die. And it's reassuring to see the data showing us uh, this pattern. And then in the soil, we have the water uh, storage and some slope gradient. So depending where you are located can also affect that early spring vigor. And for biomass, um, the main things is what you kind of know in, in the biomass set, we also have a lot of warmer sites. So the growing degree days, that is um, how much, so the peas started to grow starting at zero degrees Celsius. So above that, what is the sum of the heat that you have? That will dictate a lot of how much biomass you have. So in this sense, the southern sites have a lot more biomass. It is very different because they can even ac accumulate growing degree days in winter. They may grow slowly, but they may grow a little bit over the winter, whereas colder sites will not have that. And again, water and it comes through humidity and the soil CEC, which is you know the nutrients, the fertilizer, like how good uh, the soil is, is, of course, that will affect biomass production. Okay, so I'm going to talk about symbiotic nitrogen fixation, also called um, biological nitrogen fixation. Um, so when we surveyed growers back in 2016 and said, what traits are important to you for all these different cover crops? For the legumes, the number one trait of importance was nitrogen fixation. So they wanted to know if I'm spending all this money putting these legumes into my cover crop mix, and are they fixing nitrogen? You know, am I getting that nitrogen out of there to uh, contribute to the next crop like corn? And so we, in this similar data set that Lais explained when we had trials all over the country, we had people collect samples from that. And then um, our team in, in New York, um, this is Catherine Muller here um, and um, Lori Drinkwater from Cornell University. They evaluated different varieties and different environments um, of peas to see how much um, nitrogen they were fixing and how much total nitrogen those plants had um, to um, give to a subsequent crop like corn to offset fertilizer needs. And so I'll just go through some definitions first. So here's biomass that Lace has been talking about, the amount that's above, um, oh, thank you, Lace, you have the uh, controller, uh, the, above the ground of, of the total um, amount of that plant that's there. And then total nitrogen is going to be that amount that's available to a subsequent crop that can offset fertilizer, the amount of nitrogen that's held within that legume plant. Um, and there's a really strong correlation between biomass and total nitrogen. So in environments like Maryland and North Carolina that produce a lot of biomass, they have just more uh, nitrogen available for the next crop because um, there was just a lot of material there to begin with in, in biomass. Um, but then this, this last term here, this NDFA, that's um, the percent of the nitrogen that was fixed um, from the atmosphere by symbiotic um, bacteria within the, the nodules of the root system of the pea. Um, and you can see there's quite a difference. So um, it ranges at the bottom from zero or over here at the figure two, that, that's another good way to look at it, um, from really 0% of that nitrogen being fixed um, from the environment to 100%. And so what does 0% mean? It means that plant um, is some some call it lazy. I think others could call it strategic. <laughs> They're taking nitrogen from the soil instead of taking all of that effort and time to make an association with a microbe in their, their root structure and have that microbe um, bring nitrogen in from the air and turn it into, um, into fertilizer uh, for, for that plant and nitrogen for that plant. So you get... Um, quote unquote, lazy fixers um, or ineffective um, fixers of nitrogen. And we're seeing those in the cold environment. So this is a polar vortex year of 2019 when this data was collected. So it was very cold in Nebraska and Wisconsin um, where these um, samples were taken. And a lot of those plants really struggled to effectively fix nitrogen. Um, so we... Um, 
say, the more biomass that you get off of your peas is going to determine how much total nitrogen you have um, available for the next crop. But in some of the really colder parts of the country in cold years, um, peas seem to be struggling to fix nitrogen effectively um, in some, um, some situations. We did not see that variation in hairy vetch. So we did the same evaluation in hairy vetch and um, the all, all of the locations were able to fix nitrogen and um, you know be above that like 60 to 70 percent um, of nitrogen in the plant coming from the atmosphere um, instead of from the soil. So um, just a plug <laughs> for those that can fit uh, vetch in your rotation, you know, if you don't have small grains or you have a way of controlling vetch well, um, it does more consistently fix nitrogen. Its biomass tends to be higher in the warm climate, sorry, cold climates of the United States, especially the northern Midwest. Um, and so that might be a better fit for um, our region. Um, if it fits your rotation. If you have small grains though, you need to be careful because um, there is hard seed present in vetch um, until we develop better varieties that don't have that hard seed. Um, and it can be a weed in, in your small grain crops. Okay, next slide. So what's the future? So our, our new lines in the cover crop breeding program look very promising and they're winning for most traits. Um, so we are still collecting more data. This is an ongoing system of selecting um, better, um, using our best parents to make new crosses, you know, and um, uh, always improving so that ideally we can change that initial map that I showed you of the risk of winter peas, right? So we can move that, that border at which um, peas will die um, frequently and be able to more consistently grow peas in places like Iowa and Minnesota and Wisconsin and North Dakota. Um, and we're not there yet, but we're getting there and we're improving slowly. Um, so this year we're releasing our first lines um, as publicly available lines through um, the USDA um, germplasm system known as GRIN and um, have five lines going through that system right now. So um, that's our, our first uh, contribution to, uh, to growers and the research community on improving winter hardiness and biomass um, in pea. All right, next slide. So other ways to get involved, um, and then I'll wrap up and, and leave space for questions. Um, next year, we have a fantastic new collaboration with Seedlinked. Um, it's an organization that has um, engaged growers in variety trialing of many different um, crops, and they have a beautiful app interface to do so. And so next um, fall, you could sign up and receive three um, of our breeding lines of winter pea, grow them in a 10-foot row, um, you know, if you have a home garden or something like that, and then use the app just to report on what you like, um, how they did for winter survival in your area. And that's going to give us higher resolution to know where do these lines do well and where do they not do well? Where do peas consistently die um, and frequently die or where can peas um, be used well for growers? So then we can, you know, put that into tools um, for growers to know their risk of planting peas, um, especially in the northern Midwest. We also have variety evaluation field days and we'll likely host our next ones in May of 2024, where you can come see all of our varieties, our breeding um, material, and give us your input on what you like. Um, and hopefully can buy varieties, um, new varieties of peas in the coming years as we begin the release process. Okay, next page. And that's it. Thanks so much for your attention. And we look forward to answering any questions that you have in the next um, 10, 12 minutes. Thank you so much. All right, thank you both of you. Um, I guess get some questions started going. Why do you think it is um, that you see less um, nitrogen fixation when it is colder per se to when it's warmer? Is it just because the plant isn't actually growing or what were your thoughts on that? The guess from Catherine who did this analysis is that those plants are just really struggling. So the plants are small, they're weak, they're barely hanging on for dear life. And so they don't have those resources um, probably to fix nitrogen, right? So it takes that plant um, a lot of the, uh, the sugars that they're producing to give to the bacteria as this exchange for nitrogen, right? As the bacteria work hard. And so if that plant doesn't have enough excess resources to 
to produce that and feed the microbes, then um, the microbes just might be calling it a day and, and heading home, right? So um, that was their um, their hypothesis about what's going on, but we haven't tested that directly. All right, thank you. And then um, another thing, as a breeders, um, how do you, it seemed like the winter survival and biomass were kind of like almost polar opposites of each other. How do you find that happy medium between them to kind of get to satisfy both those needs without sacrificing one for the other? Yeah, that's a great question. Lais, do you want to try yeah, or? Sure. I think it's um, trying, like doing the crosses, having uh, information, having the data that we have now, actually with the fall, uh, biomass, winter survival, and spring, finding good, consistent locations uh, that we can try our lines. And But besides that, it's... Um, it's a it's known in peas that if they grow too much in the fall, they kind of change and they become a little bit less um, prone to survival in the winter. So I think it's you know keeping up with the huge network that we have uh, now with the seed link, we'll have even more environments to try this out. Make informative crosses so Rebecca can see all this data that we have, and then she will select the parents you know, to have hopefully like better, even better lines in the future. Yeah, yeah. but it is, it is a tough thing. Yeah. And Ty, how we do that in breeding is we look at correlations. So once you, the more the data, the better, right? So we can look at all the different sites where we have tested these peas and then we compare, okay, how is biomass doing versus winter survival, right? And if you have like a complete inverse relationship where it's like, everything that has high survival has low biomass and everything that has high biomass has low survival, we would be out of luck. But that's yeah. really the case. So typically you see this big cloud and this big variation. And so then we can, even though there's a trend in the direction that they're, you know, the, those that are the highest biomass can die. Um, we can find ones that are in um, this quadrant that has both high survival and high biomass. And we have. And so that's the way that we can move forward. You find these outliers that um, that do well for both of those traits. And I think we have, like Laisa's data shows really clearly that um, some of our highest biomass across the country were lines that were selected by growers in North Dakota and in Wisconsin in really cold environments um, and are great for winter survival too, right? So I think we can um, we can break that in this species, which isn't always the case for, for other species. So I think we're in good shape. So it's kind of more or less what you're saying. It's, it's an art and a science all rolled into one trying to get, to get the end results that you guys are looking for. Sure, yeah. All right, um, don't see any more questions coming through here. Um, appreciate both of you joining us for, for this. It was a wealth of information and we look forward to seeing these new improved winter hardy varieties coming up to us cold states up here in the North. And I ask the group if anybody um, has tried peas on on their in their garden or in their farm um, or with their research, and and what they've what they've found, what they've been frustrated by, or what they've enjoyed, because I find it really interesting to know. Yeah. yeah if anybody does have some experience with it, we do have we do have some time till the next presentation. So you're more than welcome to chime in here. Um, you can enter in the chat or if you like to ask verbally, just quickly put in there, uh, like speak verbally or something like that, and we'll get you unmuted and get that in there. Um, I guess while we're waiting for that, what have um, kind of get things rolling? What have you kind of seen as um, why people kind of are hesitant towards peas per se in like the upper Midwest and stuff. I mean, I've seen the most excitement about peas among all of the, the cover crops really. So people really want them to work. I think they're easy to, to manage with equipment um, where things like rye and vetch can be 
really successful, but like kind of um, monstrous <laughs> and tangly and, and challenging, right? And they come with their own um, negatives and peas don't have a lot of negatives that come with it. So people want it to work, um, but then get those years where it all dies um, and and uh, spend a lot of money, um, you know, putting putting in that particular trial to figure it out. Um, so I think that's what I've seen, but I've also just seen like such different perspectives. So um, I've seen growers who love icicle and growers who just like wasted so much money on icicle because it it didn't do well, right? And so I think it's interesting to see who likes likes what varieties where. Um, yeah. Okay. Here's a, somebody talking about icicle. Uh, yeah, it says they did about planted about two acres of it last fall, middle of October in West Central Wisconsin, and had about 50% stand. Okay. Thanks for letting me know. Also, Lisa, just going on the tangent of what you were saying, uh, I think ideally we would love to find a, a line that does well across all the country. So the seed companies can sell only one line to the whole company, to the whole country. And that would really, I think, you know, um, help having a, a broad adapted variety. And, and through the data, we think that we can find something like that. So 